people say, why do we do what we do? Because we know we can make a difference. And not only make a difference, but think of it as a pebble. We threw it in, then those people will go on to make a difference. And so it's God's circle of impact. And so at the end of every prayer, we say, and dear Lord, remind us to always make a positive difference in the lives we touch. My brother invited me to a Christmas party of a mutual friend. I knew the mutual friend, but I walked in the door and I'm in wool shorts and a wool turtleneck and there's no heat in the house. And yet I see him in a blue jacket and a white turtleneck and gray pants. And I turned to my friend, I said, I'm gonna go meet him. I was in the seminary studying to be a priest and I kept saying, God, send me a sign because I'm, this is getting harder, the whole celibacy thing. It just doesn't make any sense to me. And so I said, give me a sign. And she walked in the door and I went, I'll take it from here. The funniest part of all of this is the question you asked me when we sat down. What do you think of Teilhard de Chardin? But I only asked that question after she, I'd said, well, what are you doing at Webster University? She says, I'm thinking of becoming a nun. And she was stylishly dressed, a beautiful young woman, questions only a nun type person would know. And it was an obscure question of, do you know Teilhard de Chardin? And she did. I, went, I said, no. do you mean the philosopher or the <laughs> botanist? And he wasn't happy about that. We looked at our watches and it was two o'clock in the morning. I had my father's car. so. I say, I gotta go. And he walked me to the car then, and it was at that time I said, are you doing anything New Year's Eve? My brother's turning 21 on New Year's Eve, and I'd love for you to come and meet my family. I'm setting this up for future, <laughs> you know? I come at seven o'clock, we'll have a dinner, dress coat and tie, it's gonna be a formal, and, uh, Nine o'clock, he's still not there. He knocks on the door, I go, my sister says, ah, he's so nice, yeah, two hours late, you know? And at the door he says, I really have to apologize. We're a one car family, we have seven kids. I'm the oldest at home, and I had to drive six others all over town. And I have to leave in a little while to pick them up, but he won favors with me for that answer. So right answer, but tell him what my father said to you. She introduced him to her father and he said, son, haven't I seen you before? I said, yes, sir. Last night I was at the seminarian's dinner and you served dinner to me. He turns to Laura and he says, I've been trying to get them into the priesthood and you're trying to get them out. <laughs> True story. And she was. I invited him up to Webster for a prom. I was in the seminary in New Orleans, Louisiana. And he lived in Memphis. That's where we met in Memphis, but she went to school right around the corner at Webster. I was a very poor seminarian student in those days. And I had an aunt in New Orleans where I was going to school and her father died and so she Said, get this on. She said a lot of people gave me money to have masses said for him. At the time it was forty dollars, but that was in nineteen sixty eight, that was a ton of money. And I apologize to anyone and God to because I used the money <laughs> not for the mass, but, for but the to trip. get up here for the trip. Okay, so I was nineteen there and you were twenty three. We visited the zoo just walking hand in hand so that was the fun part there and then you wanted to show me the lake and the yeah, boathouse boat so house. it came over there and so we said let's just sit down for a while and someone passed by and i handed them a camera and i said would you please take our picture and they said sure so this was really our first day we were writing he never wrote to me that he didn't take his vows. His vows were to be like 
May 4th. I hear this knock. I'm home from school. I said, Mike, what are you doing here? He said, I didn't take my vows. And I'm wondering if you'd like to date. And I go, oh, well, I will. But I'm only, Someday. <laughs> but I'm only going to be home for two weeks because I'm going to leave for a year in two weeks to go to Vienna. You said, I'll take the two weeks. I remember every oh, word you said. <laughs> <laughs> at the same time, this was the Vietnam era. And at the time, I'd just been drafted. So I got a job teaching. And I shipped myself off to Deland, Florida to teach at a military, military school. Military school. <laughs> so I was in Florida and she was somewhere in, in Vienna and Salzburg for that year. I was telling people that my boyfriend's coming over and we're gonna camp out. I spent seven weeks traveling the countryside there. So I proposed to him on the way down to my parents' house and I said, why don't we get married because my lease is up in May. And he said, nothing, uh, crickets. And then I asked him again on the way back, and it was crickets. The third time was the charm. I said, well, I'm going to have to just rent a, 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 an apartment somewhere. I think that did it because I'm, I'm a penny pincher. And so we got married six weeks later. It was at a chapel at Christian Brothers College. Bought a cheap $25 white long prom dress. I sold pearls and rhinestones all around the collar, and then we made all the bridesmaids' dresses. The highlight was a tornado came through at the same time as the wedding. I was beginning of a beard, and my father said, why don't you cut that crap off your face, for God's sakes? I should have listened to him, because I look now and say, God, I look like crap. No, that was the 70s look, you yeah, know? this was the 70s, and so... And I thought he was so cool. <laughs> We thought we were so cool. So. We had no money for a honeymoon. Mike's mother took back all of our dishes, silver, china, and got about how much? $750. $750. We went out and bought camping gear. You don't need much for camping. <laughs> and so we stayed, what, five days in the tent, practically. Mm -hmm. What was the name of the park, honey? Smoky Mountain National Park. I thought we were fabulously wealthy at that point in time. We cooked every night. I would get a chicken and I'd make three meals out of it. He made his own beer, he made his own bread, and we had our own place. One investment we made, I remember it was a lot of money, $100 for a sewing machine. So I made all my teacher's outfits for the first year or two, mm -hmm. and I took enough education courses that I became a certified teacher. I could make more money if I coached the girls basketball. And with that extra money, I went to Washington U at night to get my master's degree in counseling. And so the last three years of my teaching, I was a counselor and I just adored it. We never felt poor because, to be honest, we had each other and we had this little song that we'd say, sing. There'll be lots of oh, little herrings. There'll be la lots of love and laughter no, all around. No, that's the refrain. Okay. <laughs> okay. There'll the be same. lots of little herrings mm -hmm. running mm -hmm. all around. Lots, lots of, of love and laughter always to be found. found. And when we when have no money, we'll, we'll have each other honey. And lots of little herrings running around. around. I said to him, I'm going to start a counseling program. We'll redo the garage. She'd be counseling in, in one part of the house, and I had yeah, Lauren as a child yeah. in the other part of the house. Mike agreed that he would continue teaching, and then I would stay home with her for the first two and a half years. He'd come home at 4, 4.30, I'd see my first client at five, and then I would see five, six, seven, eight, nine. Growing up as an only child, I spent a lot more time with them and their friends, maybe than other kids who had siblings. I do remember at one point talking, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? 
apparently I said, I want to be a vice president because the president brings a lot of work home and the vice president doesn't. <laughs> Mike was the vice president. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. I remember you saying that. Yeah. That is hilarious. I have special memories with my dad where we would watch Terminator or, you know, just action movies together. And then you know, we would you know, go get pizza and have special times together. So I have special memories about that. And then I have memories of my mom coming to watch me play tennis in high school. So again, I don't feel like I missed anything um, by them being so focused on the business. And they did an amazing job of not putting whatever stress they might have experienced onto me. I don't remember a time growing up where I felt like we were living on a shoestring budget. I started hearing from women how unhappy they were that they moved for McDonnell Douglas or Ralston Perina or some other big company from New York to St. Louis and how lonely they were. They missed their friends. They were angry that they had to leave their jobs. They couldn't find a job. I came home one day and I said to my I've lived relocation as a 13-year-old, and I was miserable for four years. I said, we have to stop this. We didn't even know exactly what it would be. So I've always said that everyone has a million-dollar idea, but only millionaires do them. And so you just got to get going and do what you need to do, and you can be a success. Family assistance in relocation did not exist at that time. so. He, we couldn't go to someone and say, what's going on with, with family assistance? They go, nothing. No. If we I, tell I, Joe I to move, Joe moves. What's the problem? It was totally by the seat of our pants. My sister moved 22 times and she was making the next move. I said to Mike, I'm going to go up and film her movie, film <laughs> Instamatic or whatever camera I had. And I took a hundred different slides. And I would speak at corporate events. So I would show the slideshow. And half the time, all the women were crying. Men were choked up. In 1988, uh, we started Impact Group. And that was specializing in corporate relocation for the relocating family. I started saying to Mike, we need something physical I could show these people. We need to maintain a family's momentum. That's when we named our program the Momentum Program for the Relocating Spouse and Family. So this was our first product. There was a counselor that would be assigned to the family. The strangest we ever got was, uh, could you find out what the migrating habits of alligators are? And so some mother was going, I don't want to go down to Florida and have my child eaten by an alligator. And so we said a couple of things. When you go look for a home, you don't want a freshwater lake behind your home. Bad idea. If you go to a park, don't go to a park with big freshwater lakes. Let me just say that we were the first Google and we didn't know it. He programmed all of this himself to save us $50 an hour cost. The woman that asked about the alligators had an emotional concern. That's where the counselor comes in. We found that whenever there's a big problem, there's a solution that's gonna make us a lot more money. I went to a conference where Mike made me a visor that said Momentum to match our product name. So I started wearing this visor to breakfast, lunch, dinner. It was a formal dinner. I had my Momentum hat on. I knew he was the president of the ERC and the head of Johnson Johnson, and I researched that, 5,000 moves a year, bingo. I looked to which door he was gonna exit, and then I blocked the door. He'd had to crawl over her. <laughs> to get out of there. It's like, ta-da, the conference is over, I can talk to you. I said, uh, Mr. Garan, um, can I have a minute of your time? And he said, who are you? I've seen you 
everywhere. He said, what is momentum? I said, I'm so glad you asked. I gave him my spiel. It's a program for the relocating spouse and family. His exact words, we've been looking for something like that. Well, she went to University of Notre Dame, majored in business, thank God, not art. She said she wanted to do a year of social work down in Puerto Rico, and she did a marvelous job. We had to call and tell her that I had breast cancer. They sat down and told me that my mom had just been diagnosed with breast cancer. And it was shocking because in my mind, my mom was always this pillar of strength. Quick pivot professionally, I was like, you know what? I can always find a job somewhere else down the line. Right now, let me focus on being with family. And I decided to stay in St. Louis, and it just so happened that my parents ran a business. They could give me some things to do. So we talked about it, and we said 25,000 plus room and board for six months. <laughs> so that's what she did. I realized that if I did end up following in my mom's footsteps, I don't have to walk exactly in her footsteps, like I can eventually blaze new trails. I started working at Impact Group as an account manager. I started at the bottom, and after a few months, I remember being on a walk with my mom. Basically, I came to the conclusion, I like what I'm doing, I like the people I'm working with, I like being with family. So I decided to stay and have really never looked back. When she came into the company and was in a meeting, one of the, at the big meeting room, she'd say, well, Mike, what's your opinion? And what, Mike, who? Because <laughs> at work, she always called me Mike. It was fun having her at work, and we'd often, very often, go to lunch together and hit. Yeah, those were some of my favorite memories when we were working together. I get a call from a former employee and saying, Laura, um, I'm a consultant for a corporation now, and they have a division of outplacement, and their board is requiring them to get rid of it. They asked me to assess the best outplacement firm in the country to buy them. So she said, can you come down tomorrow and make a presentation? I said, well, let me talk to Mike and let me talk to my daughter because I'd want all of us to fly down, but I'll give you a requirement unless you have the CEO of the company, and CFO and the COO, plus the two current directors of the company. And she called me back at four o'clock and said, you're on. So I hurried, I got us three flights. This is an act of God. I don't know what made me say it. I said, before we take our seats, I just want you to know one thing. We did not bring our checkbook today. He says, well, you can bet your sweet bottom, bottom, I'm not gonna write you a check to take it off our hands. And I went, bingo. And I stuck that in my brain. Some of their people would not let them out of their contracts, their service providers. And they wanted us to take it on. I think it was $450,000 it would cost us to service that account, all those accounts. Well, I think the funny thing about our different approaches is having just graduated with my MBA, I was ready to sit down at a spreadsheet and go over the numbers, come up with kind of a, a, a high level number. And she looks at it and says, mm, I think we're gonna offer this instead. I'm like, are you crazy? <laughs> you know, this is a $20 million business. There's no way they're gonna take it. She's like, well, the first thing they told us when they sat down at the table for discussing this company is the only thing that's off the table is us paying you to take the company. So I said, if you write us a check for $450,000, we'll take on all that. We'll quote unquote, buy your company. <laughs> and that's exactly what they did. They paid us to take on 130 brand new corporate clients. So it was just a really 
impressive awareness, not only of experience and business acumen and how good of a listener that she is. Our daughter, Lauren, helped us. When we got Spherion, it's kind of like you catch this whale, what do you do with it? And so the three of us, Lauren, Mike, and I sat down and I said, well, I'll take all the clients. So, so I'll take HR, a lot of the logistics. And Lauren Great. stepped up and said, I'll take over technology and finance. And I go, yes, <laughs> this is great, you know. So the three of us had it covered. That deal enabled us to go to new customers with an existing client base in that uh, product line to take over a superior market position than we ever would have been able to have before. So what I didn't realize until you were talking is what relief I felt that I didn't have to do it all alone. And I was so proud of you that you not only could do it, but you would volunteer to do it. It's, it's awesome that she has that sense of pride and, yeah. um, and joy over the journey that we've had together. It was the beginning of our transition, I would say. That's really true. General Motors called me. They had been a relocation client for over 20 years. Said, Laura, I want you to pack a bag for three days. We're gonna sequester you in a hotel. It was such a huge scope. 47,000 people were gonna be laid off. I create the program custom for them. You would think I had given them gold. And I bring it to Mike and he says, how are we gonna do that? <laughs> I've got, I've got a couple of elephants we're going to have to kill and slaughter and eat. We needed to hire 400 more coaches ASAP, and then the coaching manager had to set up a training schedule. They then offered it to every spouse, every child involved. Child, it was done. Mike says, I'm done. I'm retiring. I said, you can't. I'm only 60. And he said, nope. And it's like, ah. Oh. It's like telling a basketball player you never get to shoot another free throw, you know. I did not say you have to retire too, but we suffer from enmeshment. And so if, if one of us goes to bed at 10 o'clock, the other goes to bed at 10 o'clock. So the plain story is a lot part of me saying it's time for me to retire. We took off from St. Louis to go into Chicago. I was sitting in first class because I got upgraded and they were in the back. And we were back in, in steerage and unbeknownst to us, there was the, the plane was on fire. It was shaking. It was shaking and you just, just land in that And when field. you went past the airport, you saw 30, 40 ambulances, white foam, and when they ripped open, we saw this, they ripped open directly behind Mike and I, the inner workings of the um, plane. It was burned through. Charged. Burned through. I would say another 10 minutes, we would have been burned through. So a friend from high school that flies uh, 787 for American, we had told him this story because he's a pilot. Uh, he's telling us and he sends me a text picture of basically the plane with the engine on fire. Someone who has been through training with American is, he is saying, honestly, you guys are lucky to be alive. It's still to this day used as a, this is just lucky to have landed, everyone should have died. It, the grace of God, this plane landed and those, all the people got to walk off. We wanted to put the company up for sale and, and we had. And so Lawrence said, hey, I really want to buy it. And we said to her, honey, you can't afford it. And so she said, no, let me make a presentation to you. And, and so she did, and she came up with a great plan. As we talked about me buying this business, and honestly, I, that means that I have to take it where I want it to go. And you know, that was a little bit of a rocky time for us, maybe. Um, when, I don't know. when was that time? 
Well, during, during some of the time of do we sell, do we not sell, but that's when I felt like I took full mental ownership over um, our transition and me taking over the business. Because before, in some ways, I felt like, okay, I'm CEO, but I'm still the caretaker of their asset. And then I realized, if this is gonna be successful, this is my asset that I'm growing. And this is what I, am, I need to feel my fingerprints on where we're going, what we're doing, what we're all about. You know, building from an incredibly strong and uh, amazing foundation. And at the same time, how do we pivot to meet where I feel like the company needs to go in the future? If I have a plate full of food, would I share it with my family if they were hungry? Absolutely. It's called the Impact Group Foundation because all the money came from the success of Impact Group. One of the things we've said we're gonna help children who are in trouble and breast cancer. So it's one of the things our foundation focuses on. And we started it after we won the GM deal, which is the deal of a lifetime for us. We have it with an investment bank and so every year it makes a lot of money also. So we make sure we, all the money it makes, we give away and we start all over again and we give it away. I had the email, I saved it. So I got a strange one because it was like, Lauren runs whatever the business, I, I don't know the other parts, but the, the part that sticks out in my head, and she's in really great shape. And I'm like, so my, I, my response was definitely business or pleasure, question mark, to Cassandra. No, business or personal. Business or personal, you're right. <laughs> pleasure. See, so yeah, that's what the wet marriage has been. She makes the introduction, and I knew it was coming, he didn't. And essentially, you know, Ted's a great dad, he's an entrepreneur, he's really fun, really smart. We had our first date at a happy hour, and then Ted came over and we sat in my backyard and had iced tea from my mint plant. And uh, it was like, it was just a picture perfect first date. And then we- And there was just a pet kiss, because the way you sound that when you ended at her house. Yeah, it was, it, yeah, it, we, we, I just kissed him on the cheek. We went out again the next week and then the rest was history. So both of us were looking for a person of faith in a partner. Yes, that was a requirement, I guess I would say, yes. And especially it helps, I think, for our kids to see like our communication and our flirtatiousness and our, just the way we exist so that, again, we, I guess we saw pretty good models with our parents. By us having shared values that has it lays a strong foundation for our marriage and having our home life be easy overall makes so many other things in life easy. Kennedy was my first joyful benefit of Lauren getting married. She has such yeah. a beautiful relationship with Kennedy and I saw it from day one. It was one of the greatest gifts you ever gave me in my life was being his nanny for five months. And, and then the next best gift was me bringing in Yvonne to yeah. take over. So. <laughs> so we've got Aluka who's super fun and crazy and all that. And then we have Kennedy who's beautiful and a hard worker and follows the rules. So it's the best of both worlds. Kenny and I got under the table over there and we got a chance to play and just talk and Everything changes when you're under a table. <laughs> as a, as a grown-up, I could hit my head and go, oh, no. And I tried to be off the wall with her because that's a part of her personality. Luca will hug my legs and kiss me and then run away and then come back. Lolly, I love you. Kiss me, come back. He does it 10 times. I chose Lolly because I called Lauren Lolly growing up and my great aunt called me Lolly. And then we said to Kennedy, what should we call, what do you want to call Mike? And she said, Mikey. So this came 14 years ago from a young girl who has since grown up. She had a very difficult high school experience. And I was counseling her in high school and I saw her in my private practice. She was a very disturbed young woman and I knew it. So I gave her a way to act out these demons in my office. After two years, she went away to college. 
I never heard from her until I got this. And she says, I remain grateful to you for your help to me. She goes on to say in her note, she married. She became a professor of psychology with a PhD. What she did with those two years of help and went on to become a professor of psychiatric is awe-inspiring to me. I just want to wrap my arms around her and she said, I want to thank you because I have two stepsons now and I got married and I never thought I would if it weren't for you. And so people say, why do we do what we do? Because we know we can make a difference and not only make a difference, but think of it as a pebble. We threw it in and she has impacted so many people in so many set settings and those people will go on to make a difference. And so it's God's circle of impact. <laughs>